All right, we're gonna get started. My good friend, good friend, Bob Smith, is gonna read the rules. And then from there, we will begin with the candidates to give them their opening speeches. Bob? Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, first rule is no outbursts of any kind. Everyone must act responsible. Excuse me. Uh, time limits are given to all evenly. And questions will be asked 30 seconds and answer, answers can be in three minutes. If a question is not answered to your liking, keep your, keep to yourself and express your opinions outside the venue, please. If false is okay, but keep it limited. No threats of any kind will be tolerated. Wait your turn to ask a question or to make a statement. When addressing the candidates, make it clear to whom you're asking a question or to all. Please silence yourself and turn them off. No food, snacks, only water from any water will be provided for everyone here. Do not speak outside of your turn or until addressed, please. No one is allowed to interrupt the person speaking. No signs or banners are allowed inside the rec center. Questions that are scheduled to be asked okay, to the candidates. Right. There you go, bud. I'm gonna read the sponsors. Okay. I'm gonna thank the sponsors that made this event possible today. AA Auto LLC here at Brooksville used car sales here on Main Street. They have in-house financing. All Tier Brothers, well drilling contractor and corning service and repair oil and gas wells. Uh, dozing and tractor work, gravel hauling, grind hauling, oil and gas supervision, and consulting. Clayton Homes, uh, Clayton Homes, affordable modular homes, single wide and double wide display are available to tour. Use Clayton Homes for your next home buying experience. Google's funeral home, family care needs, send flowers and grief support, get help planning ahead, memorial service, and much more. Frank's towing and used car parts. Contact Frank the next time you need your car towed or used car parts. New Lux Healthcare and Rehab Senior Living and Assistance. Committed to providing loving care and quality service to our residents and their families. Main Street Laundromat in Kirksville is available for self-serve laundry needs and is near several restaurants and shopping facilities. KJ's Market Grocery Store on China Street near the Village Park for your gasoline, tobacco, alcohol, and grocery needs. Shuffler Straight Shooters in Kirksville. Gunsmithing, customization, and repair. We do troubleshooting, order parts, and do the repairs. Shufflers offers full cleaning services on all firearms. Shufflers is also interested in buying used guns. Now the opening statement for the three candidates are limited to two minutes. Uh, the and the, the order chosen is predetermined. It was randomly selected, and Sheriff Barger is first. Sheriff? Thank you, Rocky, and thank you for those in attendance tonight. Uh, my name is William Randall. I go by Randy Barker. I'm a native here of Crooksville, Ohio. I lived up here on North Street and Keeper Street and went to this old school called the North School at one time. In 1973, I started my law enforcement career in the Special Deputy Commission with the Muskegon County Sheriff's Office. In 1974, I graduated from the Ohio Peace Officer Training Academy. At the same time, I was attending the Muskegon Mary Technical College and received an associate degree in law enforcement. In 1975, I completed the United States Army Military Police Academy and served three years on active duty as a military policeman. In 1978 to 1981, I was commissioned as a deputy sheriff, sheriff here in Perry County under Sheriff Tom Wilson. In 81-82, I served as a police officer with the New Lexington Police Department, and in 82, assumed the duties there as the police chief, serving through 1992. In 1993, after being elected sheriff, I took the office of Perry County Sheriff. I have continuously served the citizens here in Perry County as a law enforcement officer from 1978 
to the present day, a total of 46 years as a law enforcement officer. Being sheriff is quite a vast array of responsibilities, management, budget scheduling, equipment procurement, maintenance, record retention, court security, the ministerial duties required by the courts of Perry County, like process serving, management, prisoner handling, along with transporting prisoners, conveying them to and from prison. The civil process side includes sheriff sales, summonses and warrant processing, processing CCW applications, property appraisal, advertising processes, and service of eviction notices. Validation of all warrants and active protection order, background checks, validating all entries and leads, and serving as an intelligent liaison officer for Region 7 in Ohio. During my military career, I served as a first line leader, as a squad leader, as a section chief, as a branch chief, and as a first sergeant. All, all of the positions involved with management of soldiers, managing budgets, and dealing with soldiers' needs, leadership duties, and responsibilities. I retired after serving our nation and state with 38 and a half years in our military. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Brian Ruff. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight and for those of you at home uh, probably watching. Um, I want to uh, start off by uh, letting you all know that I am a uh, proud Crooksville Ceramic. I grew up here and I lived here pretty much uh, my entire life until I was 23 years old. Uh, when I was 23, I moved to Somerset. Uh, when I moved to Somerset, I moved to Somerset in 2014. I bought my first house, uh, correction, I bought my second house, uh, my first house out of Crooksville. Um, I lived there for four years and then I uh, moved to Thornville. Uh, I've lived in Thornville since 2018. I graduated from Crooksville in 2006. Uh, after that, I attended college. Um, eventually, I would get my law enforcement certification from Zane State College. And, and while doing so, uh, I uh, was raising a son. Uh, so over the course of my career uh, and my education, uh, I have been uh, juggling several things. Uh, not only the difficulties of getting my education, but working and uh, raising children. Uh, in 2009, after I got my police certification in 2010, I would get hired on by Somerset Police Department. I would spend approximately two and a half years there, both auxiliary, uh, not getting paid, uh, and then two years as a part-time officer. Uh, from there in 2012, I got hired on at the Zanesville Police Department. Uh, in that gap between 2009 and 2012, I would get two associate's degrees, one in criminal justice, police science, and one in corrections. Uh, with those degrees, I have, still have intentions of getting my bachelor's degree, uh, and someday it'll happen, and it just hasn't happened yet. In 2012, when I got hired on at the Zanesville Police Department, I, I would spend uh, the rest of my career there until uh, currently, and I've been a detective since 2018. Uh, my time's up, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Shones, and I am currently the Chief of Police in Somerset. It has been my privilege to have served in law enforcement for nearly 35 years now. That's hard to believe. I humbly submit to you that I am very fortunate to have surrounded myself with really wonderful people my entire life. I'm certainly nothing special. I am just a product of the company that I have kept. From my junior high buddies, CYO football champions, to my teammates in high school winning the Dayton Sports Writers Trophy for football our senior year, to the Marines I served with around the world, some of whom I am still close friends today, to the same high school buddies who stood in line with me at 4.30 in the morning with thousands of other people to sign up for the Dayton police exam, helping me finish number one on that test. The men and women in the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office where I worked in the jail 
the standard bearer of detention facilities in Ohio since the mid-90s, having the capacity to house over 900 inmates. The Springfield Police Division, where I was trained by cops that they wrote a book about, Hometown Killer. It's about a double homicide in 1992. How fortunate was I to have worked with such great officers. The 97th recruit class in the Columbus Division of Police and all the units I worked with and trained with in the state and federal agencies I had the privilege to serve with. The men and women of the Perry County Sheriff's Office, who I had the honor of serving with for over a year, and the people I serve with today in Somerset. And of course, my family, especially my three daughters, who inspire me every day to be the best man I can be. Does all of this training and experience make me a better person than my opponents? Of course not. It just makes me a better trained and more experienced. Does it make me the better candidate to lead law enforcement in Perry County? That's for you, the voter, to decide. I'm honored to be considered to be your sheriff. Thank you very much for this opportunity today. The yearly budget for the sheriff's office is regularly, regularly over $2 million. What is the largest budget you have experience with? Uh, Ruff, you're up first. All right, the, uh, the budget, the largest budget I've ever had experience with is uh, approximately $140,000. Uh, that's not a $2 million budget. However, I want to key in on the word experience. Uh, earlier, I made the comment that I'm a father. Um, some of you that are in here and some of you that are, might be watching at home, I've been a parent for almost 18 years. That means I've been a parent uh, longer than some of you, but that experience doesn't mean that uh, I've got expertise and it doesn't give me the right to stand up here and say that I'm a better parent than you. Um, with that, uh, experience isn't, isn't everything. And no, I don't have the experience that these two have, uh, but I do have expertise in a lot of things. Um, whether it's a $2,000 budget or a $2 million budget, managing a budget is about maximizing your resources and utilizing the budget you have the best uh, way possible. When it comes to maximizing resources, taxpayers and the county spent over $33,000 last year per felony, uh, felony indictment, with only 60 indictments in all of 2023. Whereas I alone investigated 63 felonies myself and had 33 felony indictments. And Muskingum County handled over 900 felony indictments last year. Now, either Perry County is the safest county to live in, or there are things that can be done better. I know there are mixed feelings with uh, a county jail and what that budget could look like. However, part of the Perry County Sheriff's Office, and according to uh, Sheriff Parker's own statements, $94,000 a year, correction, $94,000 a month is spent towards housing beds in Southeastern Ohio Regional Jail and in Fairfield County. This is money that could be used towards our own jail to create jobs, to reduce crime, create revenue, and give officers the ability to better utilize their time rather than driving out of the county to look up, uh, to lock up criminals. So, whereas I don't have the experience of handling a large budget, what it comes down to is being able to use the money you have the best way possible and give your county the best resources that you can give them. Thank you. I will stick with just one piece of paper regarding this topic right here. Within the sheriff's office right there, there are several budgets that we are responsible for. And I'd like to list them for you. There's the general fund budget, the law enforcement trust, the law enforcement fund, the furtherance of justice, the Wayne National Forest budget, the sheriff's CC CCW budget, the deputy and school budget, the donation funds, the litter grant, a traffic grant, the sheriff's sales, and 
as Brian mentioned, the bed cost at the regional jail. Under the umbrella of the sheriff, I'm responsible for in one way or another, either as a board member at the regional jail or actually hands on with these budget. In 2024, our budget, I don't know where you got two million rock, you're about half off because it's four million fifty-one thousand six hundred and fifty-five dollars and forty-three cents to cover all operations there within the sheriff's office. That's the the year before was four million and ninety-two thousand, which was just a little bit more, but it decreased back to twenty twenty down to three million and 17,000, covering all those line item budgets right there. But the thing I'd like to point out the most to you is that you need to be very, very proud of the people who manage these monies, my civil clerk, my records clerk, the responsibilities that I have, because we have never had a finding for recovery during any audit in that period of time. And I'm pretty proud of that and will continue to manage your tax dollars in the same way. Ryan mentioned about the jail cost down there. It's $72 a day is the per diem in the regional jail. And if you times that by the average number of beds we have, which are around 40 beds, give or take a few, you're looking at a neighborhood of 749000 a year just to house those prisoners. Now, he mentioned the budget going higher than that, and it does because we have to sometimes often take prisoners the jails outside of Perry County where we have contracts. When that jail is full and it's at capacity, we're not going to run the risk of placing an inmate in there and subjecting our county to a liability, a suit possibly from an inmate who is in substandard conditions. Our commissioners have helped me very much with those out of state, out of county contracts. We know we have to run back and forth. It does take time to do that. Guys have to run back and forth. It's nothing new to us. We've done that for quite some time. But if we're going to talk dollars and cents here, we probably ought to use that $4 million figure. Thank you very much. Kevin? Well, by Somerset Police Department budget, it's 184000 a year based on our uh, ink, uh, property tax levy. That's if everybody pays their property taxes, so it's generally around 170,000. With that, I have two full-time officers, two part-time officers, three auxiliary officers, and one part-time support services employee. I got five cruisers that take a lot of maintenance. Prior to me being the chief of police in Somerset, I've owned seven houses. I have an investment property. I put three kids through Catholic school from uh, kindergarten through 12th grade. I sent two kids to college and grad school. But in all fairness to them, they paid me back. One is in college now. So I think that's financially successful. But more importantly, it's how we use our funding. I have the training and experience to put forth a policy and strategic plan to confront the issues facing our county. When I work with the sheriff's office, I voice cost-effective ideas which fell upon deaf ears. Proper attire for detectives, grants for employee support, money for grant writing to acquire tactical vehicles and equipment. As your sheriff, I will responsibly allocate funding to keep your families and our community safe. Thank you. Public, public relations is an important part of being sheriff. What is something you can do or will do to improve on in the eyes of the public? Sheriff, you're first. Sure. Oh, all right. Actually, it's Lisa Lair, Shelly's first. That's right. I don't know what you're talking about. Yep, I, I stand corrected. Shelly's, you were first. Oh. I'm sorry. Right. Public relations. First of all, I'm operating a Mark Cruiser. I think in Perry County, the sheriff's from Mark, uh, working a Mark Cruiser. 
so it's highly visible throughout the county. I will respond with my deputies on calls for service. I will follow up with you, with my detectives on investigations. These things I already do. Since becoming chief of Somerset, we have implemented a four-phase village safety initiative, generated a neighborhood crime and safety analysis, constructed a record section system, index, and our property room is in the final stages of being brought online with industry best practices. <coughs> we are very proud to be a charter member of the Perry County Juvenile Court Steering Committee and the first law enforcement agency to be a member of the Perry Housing Coalition. Youth Outreach, we have a 4-H Spin Club Step Forward program and a ju Junior Neighborhood Watch program. For the adults, we have Village Parks and Transient Citizen Awareness and Blessing Boxes. Because of our department's work with our youth, I was honored by being nominated by the Perry County Juvenile Court to fill a vacancy on the Board of Trustees for the Multi-County Juvenile Detention Center. In Somerset, we have had traffic studies conducted by the Ohio Department of Transportation and private entities with a focus on school zones and our village square. Directed patrols in areas determined to be problem spots for high visibility. It's public relations. We work with the Ohio State Highway Patrol on school zone safety and traffic crash reporting. I believe collaborating with these entities is paramount to public relations. From early on in my career, I have recognized the critical importance of fostering strong, trusting relationships between law enforcement and the communities that we serve, and the character of the deputy required to fulfill those requirements. Our profession must hire convincingly good people. The communities we serve deserve no less, and I take my responsibility as sheriff very seriously, and I understand that effective policing is rooted in collaboration, communication, and mutual respect, and for me, it's based on four key things. The first being transparency and accountability. I believe in transparency as a cornerstone of trust. I'm committed to open communication with the community, providing information about our policies, procedures, and our actions. We must hold ourselves accountable for our decisions, our actions, welcoming constructive feedback and striving for continuous improvement. The second keynote is accountability for misconduct. I recognize the impact of police misconduct in trust, on trust and legitimacy. I'm committed to holding myself and my staff accountable for maintaining the highest standards of professionalism and integrity. It is imperative, it's imperative that allegations of misconduct are thoroughly investigated and appropriately discipline act, disciplinary action taken when warranted. The third key is that of community engagement. We'll continue to seek out new ways to engage with community members and groups through various initiatives, including neighborhood meetings, town halls, community events, and advisory boards. We must be willing to listen to the concerns and priorities of residents seeking and welcoming their input and developing strategies to address local needs and challenges when appropriate. My fourth one is a proactive problem solving. In closing, the amount of time I believe my working together. You get three minutes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, then I'll cover the second one. The proactive problem solving. We employ a community-oriented policing approach, working proactively to identify and address underlying issues contributing to crime and disorder by employing new techniques, partnering with residents and community organizations. We can develop tailored solutions to local concerns, focusing on prevention, intervention and long-term solutions. In closing, I believe my work together, by work, I believe by working together that we can create a safer, healthier environment where everyone can test values, can, I'm sorry, can feel the values, respect and empower. Together we can build the trust and strength of our communities.
Thank you. Um, so, public relations. Uh, my intentions, if elected chair, would be to be more present. Not just more present for, um, for the community, for the public to see, but for my department to see. Uh, I enjoy being in a cruiser. I enjoy handling calls. Uh, whether it's 3 o'clock in the morning, I get, I'm an on-call detective right now. I get called out for uh, burglaries, rapes, murders. And at three o'clock in the morning, I'm responding. Uh, I, I think it's important that our, the officers that I would be uh, in charge of could see that I can go out there, I can do the job, and I can be right there uh, when they need it and when the department needs it and when the community needs it. Uh, on top of that, I would be willing to uh, work shifts, uh, run patrol, uh, handle accidents uh, when needed, and. If somebody decides they want to take off running from me, I'm going to chase them down. Why? Because that's my job as a law enforcement officer, and that's what the public and Perry County needs, is somebody that's willing to uh, do all aspects of the law enforcement job. Uh, I understand that getting elected sheriff is an administrative position, uh, more so. However, I don't think it should take away from the basic abilities of what a law enforcement officer is. On top of that, I would like to uh, make sure that every school in the county has a school resource officer. And yeah, that's, uh, that doesn't just look good or sound good, but I think that's crucial in creating uh, a public trust and uh, rapport with the students of all of these different schools to know that they can go up and have that comfort with a deputy or with an officer so that if something goes wrong at home or something that they're dealing with, they can go to somebody, they can trust them to do what needs to be done. On top of that, accountability. Accountability has been mentioned already, but it's accountability within the department. Uh, there's always checks and balances, and I don't think, I, I've mentioned that I'm a detective, I don't think that I'm any better or worse than anybody, but I do have skill sets that I can help, uh, help the sheriff's office, help fellow detectives that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis in Zanesville. I am good at what I do, and I enjoy doing the things that I do. And if that means that I get to help others and hold others accountable to a uh, standard that I'm used to, that's that's what I'll do. Thank you for your time. What changes and accomplishments can be expected to be seen by the public in the first several months of you being chair. Barker, you're first. First of all, I'd like to say that the word change implies there's something needing fixed. And I kind of look at change in a little different light. One of the principles for which I stand is respecting public opinion which helps us to better perform our mission no matter how small. Procedural changes, some dictated by legislative changes, some mandates, some examples include like traffic laws, registering sex offenders and arson offenders, processing CCW applications. The civil office at the sheriff's office is now compliant with the state of Ohio standard processing and using an online system for foreclosures and sales. Process with an unfunded mandate processing public records requests. We work, we are working on all the legislative changes mandated to the 911 system that primarily deal with the staffing levels and training requirements established by the collaborative. Well, those changes are things oftentimes that are mandatory. The things that we'd like to implement includes a power DMS, that's an acronym for a digital managing software system that will allow us to track our employees up-to-date scheduling to track their schedule and system will help us interface with the county's payroll system and this will obviously help us save time and money in the long run. The Power DMS software platform will help our office with recruiting, training, equipment tracking, 
and helps protect our employees and assist with community engagements. We're also working on, and hopefully we'll be implementing soon, a thing called the Sheriff's App, where you'll be able to download an app on your phone, look at that app and see what information is current that we have actually posted to that site. And if other agencies buy into this, be able to find out services that they may offer as well, like children's services, like the health department, that any agency that might be interested in participating in that. We're also working on upgrades at the new office. We've moved half of our staff over to 121, which is the building the commissioners have vacated. We're working on the security issues there, along with the 911 center. And we're also working on a building out on 345 where another portion of our staff is located. Our evidence room is out there and it almost meets the International Association property and evidence room standards. We're so close to complying with that. We're currently at a group two level, meeting the Ohio collaborative standards. And that deals with procedures on hiring, use of force standards, dispatching, body-worn camera devices, community engagements. It is a certification process for Ohio law enforcement based on professional standards and for meeting best practices. We are presently and will continue to work toward the next levels of three, four, and five. I've got a long way to go. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. I got rough next. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So, some things that I want to do uh, are increase positive relations with the smaller departments. Um, some things that uh, I, I think are important is that all departments, all of the smaller departments, including the sheriff's office, uh, work together to provide uh, safety and security. It, it's not a sheriff's department and small towns are at it for themselves. Uh, I want to get everybody working together. Um, I wanna make sure that uh, all the hours are covered throughout the county, and that might seem like a hard feat, but it's something that the county needs. Uh, there shouldn't be uh, a uh, Sunday afternoon in this town where there is no laws uh, or, or no law enforcement. Uh, people, people need the coverage and people need to see that. And I think that's important and is something that I would strive for as the elected sheriff. I would want uh, deputies and officers in the smaller departments getting more training. Uh, I would want to recruit and grow the Perry County Sheriff's Office as much as I could. Uh, the, one of the benefits to the Sheriff's Office is uh, an auxiliary list. Uh, you know, if you fill up the paid positions, keep an auxiliary list and use those uh, lists and use those people uh, to maximize your resources and cover the areas that need covered. Uh, another thing that I've already touched on, felony indictments. Uh, I think uh, if you put the message out there that it is being investigated, these, these crimes aren't going unnoticed and that we can, uh, can and will put felons in prison, uh, that sends a message to other criminals that might be out there running around, hey, we don't wanna go to Perry County because they don't mess around. We're not looking at uh, a few uh, felony indictments a month. We're looking at uh, dozens. Um, uh, greater presence in the schools. Uh, I already mentioned the uh, school resource officers. Um, I would like to work on getting the D.A.R.E. program back up and running in the schools. Uh, I already touched on the rapport of uh, students and officers, but I think that, uh, that teaching and that program, uh, I always enjoyed it growing up. Uh, but it was always something that we had an officer that we could go to, and that's something that I would like to implement again. Uh, a special response team. Uh, there are situations where a special response team and a hostage negotiator are important. I myself am a hostage negotiator. 
Um, a special response team, you might not need them regularly, but it's something that needs to be implemented and something that needs to be on hand and people ready to respond in case that situation uh, happens, a barricade situation or a hostage situation. Um, that's, that's something that needs to be on hand and ready to go and people ready to respond for those important events. Thanks. Okay. The first thing I would do is, is create a better culture at the sheriff's office. Provide a high quality of life for my employees. Money's not everything. Many studies have proved that. It's job satisfaction. Pride in how we serve the public and provide for our families. Giving our children the best lives we can. It's job security the equipment, training, and the opportunity to thrive. And support from those who are in charge. I will implement an aggressive zone patrol plan with strict first line supervisor oversight to prevent crime. I will train and assign a detective to work with Perry County Children's Services in investigating child abuse cases. I will collaborate with Northern Local Schools to dedicate a deputy to that district and make sure the one in Southern Local Schools remains there. And we'll work with Crooksville as well to get a, a resource officer in Crooksville. I will graduate our detention facility from its embarrassing present state to a worthy legal temporary holding facility and over time to a 12-hour facility. As sheriff, I would love to work with the commissioners and judges to make a 12-day facility and eventually a full service jail to serve the people of Perry County. And very importantly, I will use my experience working years in various undercover narcotics assignments to bring back a highly effective drug task force with a well-trained tactical team. A joint task force is under development involving village departments due to the lack of drug interdiction operations at the county level now. And we'll get more into that later. Thank you. All right, before we continue, I meant to do this at the very beginning, but for anybody who needs to use the, use the restroom, there's two restrooms over here and in the hallway. School safety has become a larger issue in recent years. What are your thoughts on how this can be addressed locally to prevent or reduce school violence? Rob, you're up. All right, I've touched on this already uh, with my thoughts of school resource officers. Uh, I think every, every district should have a school resource officer. Um, at the end of the day, these school resource officers, uh, they're not just uh, flying out at the end of the school day. They're going out and they're helping uh, direct traffic. They're helping direct traffic because we have 16, 17, 18 year old kids that are driving for the first time that they need directed, uh, you know, how they should be driving and I need a little oversight. Uh, you know, we've all been 16, we've all been 17 and in high school and um, you know, having a school resource officer that is out there and helping with traffic, I think that would help with accidents. Um, just right out here in front of uh, Crooksville High School, um, there was an accident at the end of the day and a little girl got killed. Uh, who knows uh, if she was, if there was an officer there that day directing traffic and helping, uh, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Um, but. At, uh, at the very least, uh, it's something that I think we can implement in the future. Uh, and I mentioned the D.A.R.E. program. I think that is a, uh, an excellent program uh, to, to implement and for these kids to feel safe with officers. You know, I, I work in Zanesville and I deal with kids that think, oh, police officers, we're scared. We don't want to go talk to them because that's, that's a mindset that they've grown up with or they're not 
uh, acclimated with somebody in law enforcement. Uh, but I think that uh, public uh, rapport with students uh, is going to be crucial as they get older. Uh, Sorry, I forgot my notes here. On top of, uh, on top of both of uh, these incidents or these situations with the D.A.R.E. program and a school resource officer, I mentioned a special response team uh, before. Um, in Zanesville, we have a special response team that reacts and does training in these buildings. They know where the uh, escape exits are. They know where um, the layouts of the buildings and they know how to respond and where to respond and they go through um, hours of training and even basic officers uh, go through the training of hey we show up we know where the school um, where these different rooms are and where these kids might be hiding because we've got to go in and we have to protect these kids and take out a threat that could be inside of the building roaming around with a gun uh, that's that training is crucial and it helps in law enforcement and would help with the sheriff's office and being able to, uh, you know, get rid of a threat that is in one of our school systems. And as of right now, um, a special response team responding to one of the high schools or one of the elementaries, uh, do they have that training? Do they know where to go and are they familiar with the school systems or are they just an employee of the Perry County Sheriff's Office? Thank you. Sure. Continue on here, the uh, involvement with local school districts with active shooter training, we know is crucial, and we have done that. Continue to cultivate and establish new relationships with law enforcement partners to include local, state, and federal. We utilize police agencies throughout the county to respond to the schools if they are closer than we are. Um, on our behalf, during recent county threats, we continue to utilize statewide terrorism analysts and the Crime Center Stack. The Stack facilitates the gathering analysis and sharing of crucial and critical information in a timely and effective manner. And the analysis free of charge are essential in helping us monitor open source media platforms and the majority of attacks that Leaky just found oftentimes. We use technology. Uh, we're trying to implement a program uh, utilizing what's called a flock cameras. The Marks Radio panic buttons are in the schools and maintaining the ability to remotely monitor in-house school cameras. We can do that at the Sheriff's Office to see what's going on inside that school to monitor the activities, enhance threat assessment capabilities and officer response times. We continue to the joint training exercises with law enforcement, fire and EMS faculty staff, and in some instances even the students involved in that training as well. We continue to enhance the communication with districts, mental health providers, and parents so that we are capable of creating a clearer picture of possible threats. We can do this by assisting with the development of threat assessment teams. The threat assessment team is a good there's a group of officials <clears throat> that convene to identify, evaluate, and address threats potentially to school security. The review incidents of threatening behavior by students, current and former students, parents, school employees, or other individuals. The goal would simply be making sure we're the smoke detector and not the sprinkler head. The majority of school shootings are over in just minutes and sometimes even seconds. Whereas periods of planning can occur over weeks, if not several months. Stopping an attack must occur during the planning phases. 
Threat assessment teams can help mitigate attacks, stopping the attacks before the monster actually enters the building. We have had their officers here before in Perry County, but sometimes funding that helps fund these positions does run out. And we rely upon the general fund to fund deputies on the road. And sometimes I have to make a choice, which would I rather have? Someone to respond to your home in an emergency or someone Great sitting in the school? Thank you. In Somerset, we have a great relationship with both our schools, Somerset Elementary and the Holy Trinity Catholic School. In early February of last year, the principal of Holy Trinity School reached out to me and said the sheriff's office approached him about doing an active shooter drill at the school. And asked me what I thought about that, and I said, absolutely, I'm on board 100%, and I reached out to the sheriff's office via email, and I got no response from them in regards to that, because we take it very seriously. There, there was an active shooter drill down in Southern Locals prior to that, and uh, every drill, every exercise is fantastic, regardless of how good or bad it goes, but information got back to me that things were, could have been done better, so my idea was we had there's certain entities out there that can assist us with this type of drill. And uh, I know how to reach out to them, so let's all collaborate and do it. And you can take the lead. The sheriff's office, the big boys on the block, you, you guys take it, we'll assist, but we've got to work together. No response from the sheriff's office in regards to that. Um, we did, we had a meeting with all the entities beforehand and the sheriff, there was a sergeant from the sheriff's office that did come to that one meeting, so I'll give him credit for that. And, and he positively uh, contributed to that event. I mean, he was fantastic. I, was, I, I never heard from him again. I, I wish that he would have worked with us. I sent dozens of emails to over 90 recipients over the three months that we planned for this. The sheriff's office did not reply to one. We did teacher training. We had entities come out from the Department of Public Safety and other agencies from around the region assisted us with this. On May 24th, 2023, we had an active shooter full-scale training exercise involving two scenarios with 27 organizations participating. A dozen law enforcement agencies from around the region no one from the Perry County Sheriff's Office attended. Afterward, I texted the sheriff and asked for an explanation as to why no one from his agency attended. Because we had to put together an after action report that would disseminate to all the different organizations that participated for training purposes and, and funding. He responded, that he had too many commitments that day that required everyone available just to meet the day's demands. A check of the run log that day showed the sheriff and several SIU unit members attempting to serve one warrant that afternoon. On April 2022, April 14th to be exact, in my weekly report to the sheriff, I noted there were approximately 500 active unserved local warden warrants Wrap it up. At the, at the sheriff's office. I'm glad that over a year later on that day, we were holding a school safety training. He decided to go out and try to serve one of those. Wrap it up. It's wrapped up. What steps would you take to reduce crime rates in our county? Shows, you're up. Well, in addition to what I brought up before about the changes and accomplishments that can be expected, to reduce crime, I would foster a positive working relationship with the village police departments by entering into binding memorandums of understanding 
and solid mutual aid agreements to include countywide training so everyone is on the same sheet of music. I will strategically plan with village chiefs for better 24-hour road coverage around the county. I will collaborate with them for use of sheriff's office resources, such as the evidence room, crime scene investigators, and detectives for major crimes. I will advocate for a county jail so our judges can properly incarcerate criminals and stop this revolving door of people being arrested and then let back out on the street again. A jail in our county would be good for the economy, creating local jobs and revenue by providing bed space for other jurisdictions instead of us paying them. I will continue my already good relationships with surrounding agencies, including the Central Ohio Drug Enforcement Task Force and state agencies such as the Bureau of Criminal Investigations, the Ohio Organized Crime Investigations Commission, and the Ohio Narcotics Intelligence Center. Finally, I will implement a robust auxiliary program, much like we are launching in Somerset now, and start a Citizens Police Academy to partner with all the great people of paradise in our fight against crime. When I read Rocky's question here about the crime rate in our county, obviously I was waiting on our end of the year report to back and do some studying to see exactly what the record shows. The record does not show any significant increase in any of the theft-related crimes that are occurring or have occurred here in Perry County. In fact, only two of those particular crimes out of the 10 we track, that being larceny, or I'm sorry, identity theft and larceny out of vehicles, are the only two that showed any minor increase. The burglary rate, the B and E rate, the shoplifter, robbery, stolen car, all those things have taken significant decreases, some up to 45% decrease in our burglaries. But what is on the other side of the fence is the violent crime rate that has taken some jumps. But I have been smart enough to figure out how to make everybody love one another and get along. Because what crimes are up are domestic violence, domestic disputes, neighborhood troubles, things that involve at least two people in those types of crimes. There are some that have some decrease. We're very fortunate in Perry County. Guess what? We had a 100% increase in homicides because we had one in 2023. We had one in 2022. So I think that we ought to be pretty happy. The one we had last year was where Brian at here was in your village right here, wasn't he? And we assisted the Crooksville Police Department with that particular homicide there. I wasn't satisfied that those statistics were really going to hold water, right? I was only comparing one year to two years. So we even went back five years and even 10 years and showed the comparisons here between from 2013 to 2023. And once again, we're showing a 38% decrease in burglaries of theft crimes in Perry County. Crimes of violence, as I said, I can't control people's behavior, but even several of them show significant decreases in, in that particular category right there. Ryan alluded to the number of cases that he tries in Zanesville versus what happens here in Perry County. And I submit that I overlooked the last time I spoke about how those cases are processed when the county prosecutor in our office Jackie, correct me if I'm wrong, is a part-time position, isn't he? And he selects those cases that he wants to take because he has a private practice as well. And it's no fault of Joe's. That's just how he chooses to operate. But in questioning the candidate, one of the candidates, who are you at, TJ, about your position on prosecuting has Three indicated minutes. that you would be a full-time prosecutor. So hopefully then, 
We have 15 drug lab cases still pending that we're waiting on. So when those results come back, we can proceed with prosecution. But our felony cases this year were 70 cases, which is the highest we've ever had in the past four years. Thank you. All right, I'm going to continue uh, with some of what uh, Sheriff Parker was saying. Um, as far as the uh, lab results, so I, I too have resources with the Central Ohio Drug Task Force. And, and when it comes to uh, crime prevent, prevention and uh, drug enforcement, um, there's a device called a TAC ID. And with the TAC ID, you can get a positive result of what that, uh, what that chemical substance is that you just pulled off of somebody. Now, in Zanesville, a TAC ID result gives enough to the prosecutor's office to allow for a felony indictment. That means that drug user is, um, that drug user's off, off the street. They're in jail. They're not out, you know, seeing what other score they can get, what other town they can uh, rummage and pillage. They are in jail and they're gonna sit there until they do one of two things. Uh, their lab results come back from the uh, Bureau of Criminal Investigations or from the uh, Central Ohio Drug Task Force lab. And with those results, they're either going to go to prison or they're going to go to trial and then be presented with the same information that I just talked about. And then they'll probably still end up in prison. But if you don't have the resources, if you don't utilize the resources that you have available, to get that information in front of a prosecutor. You can't get those indictments. Um, with uh, also saying that, um, where are we taking all of these people that we're indicting? We've got to take them clear to regional jail. And, and I understand jails uh, get, um, they, they fill up and they can fill up quick, especially when you are prosecuting cases and you're doing it at a, at a fast rate because you have those resources available. Well, if Perry County had a jail, we're not driving a 50 minute drive to regional jail, which is approximately what it is for somebody in Somerset. I know, I work there. I used to spend most of my shift arresting somebody, driving them clear to Nelsonville, driving clear back to Somerset, doing my report, driving back to Perry County. Well, all of that time, officers can be in our communities. They can be patrolling. They can be catching somebody else or they can be shortening response times because that's what our communities need. And doing that, and studies have shown that building a jail reduces crime rate in the areas that those are built. Now, I, I know this because Matt Lutz, Sheriff Matt Lutz in Zanesville is working on a really large project of getting a brand new jail built. And where's he putting it? He's putting it off of Pershing Road, one of the worst crime areas in the city of Zanesville. And the reason, part of the reason for that, or some of the studies reflect that it reduces crime rate. Because who wants to live next to a jail or what criminal wants to be breaking the law right next to a jail? Not very many. Here's the last question I have before we go to public comments and questions. Perry County, Ohio, village police departments are under more stress and pressure than what they are used to. What can you do to help provide resources and support to these departments in need? Sheriff Barger, you're up. Who is this table they already do for these buildings, police departments? With the exception of New Lexington, who has their own dispatcher. We take call information that are taken from the public for these police agencies. We do a computer aided dispatch entry made for all calls that come in from these villages. We dispatch village officers to calls if they're on duty. And if there's no village officer on duty, depending upon the type of a call, if it's an act of property crime or crime of violence, a dispatcher is dispatched, or a deputy is dispatched to handle that call. 
If it's one of non-priority nature, it will be held in the CAD until the next time a village officer is on duty. We create CAD calls for all calls reported to the office by radio, by the village units, traffic stops, direct calls, etc. As far as lead services go, we have holders of records with all these agencies. We run their license plate, their driver's license check, their other leads information. Uh, we run computerized criminal history checks for them. We enter stolen articles, stolen vehicles, missing persons for them. An information exchange program is needed to release leads, documents to village officers. Simply states that the officer will follow the lead rules concerning criminal justice information and that only the documents are given to the village officers that the village has, respond, has responded for any violation. So those are the services that we provide them at no cost. Now, if you look at the total number of calls for service, and I'll use two years, 2022 and 2023, the Sheriff's Office handled 18,286 calls for service in 2022. In 2023, it jumped 18,692. That tells me that there's a remaining 3,639 calls for all the other villages within the county. That's Thornville, Somerset, Shawnee, Roseville, New Streetsville, Junction City, Crooksville, Corning. And in 2023, 20% of those calls were handled by the villages. I have a hard time biting off that question, Rocky, where you said that they're under such great stress when I look at the information from the Perry County Grand Jury, which we track the records of what cases were actually submitted by our prosecutor to the Perry County Grand Jury to seek indictment on felony cases. In 2023, there were 42 cases presented by the Perry County Sheriff's Office. Guess how many were submitted by the village PDs? 50, I'm sorry, 10. There were 52 total. Three of those were by the Highway Patrol, two of them by the Adult Parole Authority, one of them by Crooksville PD, and four of them by the New Lexington Police Department. Three minutes. None of the villages that I mentioned submitted one case to the Perry County Grand Jury for a criminal indictment in 2023. Who's overworked? The men in gray and black. As I've said before, um, establishing positive relations with the smaller towns. Um, I understand that the smaller towns might not be dealing with as much as what the Sheriff's Department is dealing with. Um, what I also can understand is that maybe these smaller departments, uh, they don't have the training. And they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. They don't know how to put together a felony packet. I can tell you when I worked in Somerset, I couldn't have put together a felony packet. But guess what? I worked there five nights a week, and that's what I did on midnight shift. Um, thankfully, I had a buddy named Nick Sabo that helped me through that. But we're not just talking about now, and we're not just talking about the last couple of years. We're talking about the future. We're talking about Google with a $2 billion purchase over near Lancaster. We're talking about Intel going on, uh, going in north of Perry County, uh, up in the northern part of Licking County. The northern part of Perry County is exploding. And what happens when more money comes around? More crime. Why? Because the criminals are going to go to where there are places being built up. You know, new constructions, uh, new houses being built. Those buildings are being pillaged, uh, copper torn out, you know, equipment stolen. And uh, I think part of what needs to happen or, or can happen is the use of facilities in different parts of the county. Now, I've been talking to people in the southern part of the county and I've talked to people in the northern part of the county. Uh, why aren't there substations? Why aren't there these resources? Now, I understand that there's a budget that you have to work with. But if we're working together as small communities and as a county as a whole, 
then we should be able to utilize each other's resources. And in doing so, uh, there's no reason that the sheriff's office can't make some type of a, uh, a he, he mentioned an MOU, a memorandum of understanding with Thornville PD or with uh, Corning that, hey, we're gonna utilize your office. We're gonna, we're gonna sit there during these hours or we're gonna patrol in this area. And if we need to use the restroom, if we need to use the computer, if we need to just sit and take a break because we've just handled a call that we've spent half of our shift dealing with, we're gonna take a seat in your office. Because why? Because the communities need to work together. And that's something that is gonna be huge in moving forward and the growth around Perry County. Because we're not just talking about now or the past, we're talking about moving forward into the future. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to race through this, so stick with me. In June of 2022, as a result of several deconfliction issues with the Sheriff's Office, I reached out to the Sheriff in an attempt to set up a memorandum of understanding on how our agencies could operate together. He responded by saying, as the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of Perry County, what need does my office have to enter into an MOU with your department? He then mentioned his associate, his association director and the county prosecutor. I don't know where he was going with that. In November of 2022, we had an overdose in the village and I responded with Somerset Reading Fire Department. And I was trained to carry a go bag with me at all times. I carried it off duty, on duty. What it is is everything that a, that a cop needs is in the bag. Narcan, first aid kit, weapons, more rounds, okay? So I responded to that, that overdose, the person was acute respiratory failure. My Narcan, two Narcan, um, doses given to the individual and I whipped out my handy uh, respiratory mask and gave her life-saving breaths. We brought her back textbook. The fire department had the AED and we, and we did a great job bringing her back. There was no medals, no write-up in the paper, just another day of being a first responder. That's what we signed up to do. My investigation revealed the product came from outside the village and the county. There was no cooperation with the sheriff's office. There was no task force. As a matter of fact, at that time, for three years, the sheriff didn't even talk to the task force commander. For three years, there was no communication there. He dissolved the task force. In response to that, Somerset PD and New Lex PD met with the county prosecutor for guidance and started the joint task force. I got approval to spend $2,500 to join the Central Ohio Drug Enforcement Task Force. The drop in the bucket, the bargain, a great organization to use their resources. We sent two officers to train with code, six officers to basic SWAT school, three officers to advanced SWAT school, and I went to SWAT team leader school. All for under 500 bucks. In February of 2023, at the quarterly code meeting, Sheriff Parker voted against Somerset PD being allowed to be part of the task force, knowing full well my years of experience in drug enforcement work. Of course, he was the only one. Every other, every other agency voted us in and we're all the better for it today. The coroner called me just yesterday, so I'll be using the code lab again tomorrow. Thank you. Well, this is Bill Pender. Are you here? Yeah. You guys can stay seated and I'll come to you. out in the community and I'm just 
curious the importance you all feel is in regards to drug and alcohol treatment rather than just locking them up and sending them to prison. Because someone will continue on the same behavior if they're always under the influence of a mind-altering substance. Sean McIntyre. We want to answer her question? That was a statement. Oh, yeah. I was confused too. It was not a Cooper Duvall. Did I say that correctly? I hope. Cooper Duvall. Oops. Eric Hawkinson. Hock Hock Here. All right. This is for uh, the sheriff and uh, Chief Shem. Uh, so you spoke quite extensively on your experience, drug enforcement, the undercover stuff, the 35 years of experience. And even in your flyer, you, you said that you mentioned the cartels and the free-flowing drugs in the Perry County. And uh, we recently hosted a drug interdiction uh, roundup with, with the sheriff's department at 10, 10 different law enforcement agencies. Um, and 30 different law enforcement officers inside the county at that time. I was wondering why you didn't get any drug indictments in 2023 to the prosecutor's office as chief of Somerset. That's a great question. The, why do we have any indictments out of Somerset? I've got 1.2 square miles to cover. The, the, the only felony that we're investigating right now it was one that we inherited from the prior administration. It was a flowing assault there. So we're working with the prosecutor's office to do that. As far as the drugs, if they don't come in, if they're, if they're not coming in originating from Somerset, I have no jurisdiction to investigate, to investigate those. I can't generate without cooperation from the biggest department in the, in the county. I talked to the prosecutor's office with uh, T.J. Rawson, who was the chief of uh, New Lex at the time. We tried to establish something, and Joe said, you guys can't do nothing outside of your, your, uh, your prospective villages. So that's a great question. And I think with my, with my experience at the county level, we'll be able to stop that. We'll be able to, to implement better drug enforcement tactics and, and make more indictments. But it's not just about indictments. You have to get convictions. You know, you can indict a ham sandwich, right? You know that old saying. You gotta get convictions. You gotta work with the prosecutor's office to get that. And thank you for your question. Brandon. I do not have a last name, but if you texted me, your name is Brandon. I thought you no. directed that to both of us. Oh, did you, was that directed to both of them? Yes. Okay. Okay, Can you repeat that real quick? Yeah, the, the question. The question was uh, in the in the flyer that he spoke of. He mentioned the cartel and that that we um, must stop them. Meaning, I'm assuming all law enforcement. Um, I'm sorry, my wrong question. Uh, the campaign flyer. Uh, we must stop the cartels and the free flowing drugs in Perry County. I told him about the uh, the organ uh, the operation that we had with 30 law enforcement officers and 10 different law enforcement agencies inside the county to include himself and the fact that of his years of experience. And I was just asking him why he believed there to, that he couldn't get anything out of his village in 2023 to go for an indictment and was wondering if you could discuss what Perry County took in those same time frames, 2023 the grand jury. Well, no, in 2023, we took 42 cases. Some of them were drug cases out of the 52 that were presented. But that information you're reading from the way I took that flyer was he has knowledge of this overflow of drugs in our county and knowledge of the cartel. And I immediately questioned our detectives and our lieutenant in charge of that if he'd ever received such information, and his answer was no. So if I don't receive that information, I'm really not sure how I can validate that comment. 
after cartel was overflowing drugs in the very county. I don't deny that drugs are here, but if there's information out there, was it shared with the code task force? Was it shared with the Perry County Sheriff's Office? The only agency that I know has reached out to us is Crooksville's passed up on us and New Lexington PD has. Thank you. Hey, Ronnie, can I do a rebuttal on that? I'll give you one minute. Well, I think it's obvious that the cartel is bringing drugs into the county. You know, methamphetamine was manufactured here, uh, you know, by, by people that were making it in their trailers. But the cost effectiveness of that is not existing anymore. So it's much more cost effective for drug dealers to, to just buy from, uh, coming up from the cartels through Portsmouth, through the uh, all the way down to the pipeline in Mexico. I don't even tell the sheriff that. I mean, that's common knowledge. So as far as funneling information, I, 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 I talk to Adam all the time, it, it, you know, in response to, we, we were part of that drug roundup that we did the other day. So, I mean, that's, that's just common sense. Thanks. Thank you. First thing, I want to thank all three of you for what you do. Um, I have a tough question here, and this is coming from the NRA. If the governor of this state came to you as the chief law enforcement of this county and asked you to remove the firearms of the citizens of Perry County, how would you handle that? That's a pretty easy one. It kind of ties into the first question and the second phase of this about this red flag law. And it's pretty easy to understand this red flag law. It wants to allow loved ones and law enforcement to intervene by petitioning a court for an order to temporarily prevent someone in a crisis from accessing guns. Well, during domestic violence cases, we confiscate guns. If we have court orders, we confiscate guns. We seize them as evidence, we confiscate guns. And as part of any order from a court that involves a domestic violence case, when a protection order is issued, we seize a gun. But the most important part here was that the Buckeye State Sheriff's Association disseminated information telling us that we're under an obligation. He is. He is, I am, and Brian is, and the cops of mine are sitting over here to do one thing, and that is to support the Constitution of the United States of America and the state of Ohio. And it is the duty of the elected sheriff that I shall uphold both constitutions and enforce the laws as passed and enacted by the legislative branch of each segment of the government. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, ultimately in the United States Supreme Court and the lower portions of the court that possess the power to interpret the laws and determine the constitutionality of those laws. I'm a gun member, a proud gun member. I'm an NRA member. I'm happy to have a firearm. But if the laws change and they tell us that we've got to take that firearm for what reason it might be, I'm going to be the first one to the door. Because that's what you folks have elected me to do. That's what he's been appointed to do, and that's what he's been appointed to do. If we don't, who are we letting down? You. So as Sheriff Parker said, this is part of the, the red flag laws that uh, a lot of the states are implementing. But part of the red flag laws specifically is that law enforcement can come into a house and they can take firearms away from people without just cause. That's not legal. That's, that is not uh, what the Constitution says is legal. That's not what the people of Perry County uh, want to deal with. You know, as the sheriff, you are to stand up to all enemies uh, and that would include tyrannical governments. Uh, the state of Ohio can pass a law, but 
to give law enforcement the ability to just take firearms unprecedented or without just cause. Uh, I, I don't believe that's a stance that uh, uh, I'm willing to take. I'm a gun owner. I've been hunting since I was nine years old. Um, I love guns. My kids know how to shoot guns. But you can't just take guns because Joe Schmo over here calls the police and says that you're a danger to our society. And you say, oh, we're showing up and we're taking your guns because the guy across the street doesn't like you. Uh, I believe uh, maybe I've interpreted the red flag laws a little differently, but uh, I don't believe that that's right. And I think the chief law enforcement officer of the county has a duty to stand up to that type of a law. Thank you. Well, Commissioner, to directly answer your question, I would not want to tell the governor to pound sand, okay? Because that's, that's no legal order to begin with. But law enforcement officers operate under levels of uh, thresholds of the ability to operate given by the law. And as far as red flag laws, it's probable cause. I can't arrest somebody without probable cause. I can't get a search warrant without probable cause. I can't take a gun without probable cause. Articulable <laughs> probable cause, okay? Red flag laws focus on ex parte orders given by the courts. Ex parte meaning there's one person that goes and testifies in front of the judge and they issue a temporary order generally seven, 10 to 14 days afterwards, the other part of that complaint has to come and testify, okay? We're not gonna come take your guns. Red flag laws, these things are, it's, it's, it's infringing on our Second Amendment rights. And as an elected chief law enforcement officer of the county, man, it's not gonna happen. Not with Sheriff Shims, thank you. Chief Jones has, has done it too. Uh, midnight shift, two o'clock in the morning in Somerset. Thornbill gets, uh, there's a business in Thornbill that gets broken into. Guess who's responding? It was Somerset PD by myself because the one deputy that was on duty was in the southern part of the county. Uh, 
Uh, like I said before, it's about resources and use, utilizing the resources you have. Um, if it means calling up your auxiliary list, if it means uh, spreading out the officers or the deputies that are on day shift or afternoon shift to get that coverage, if it means working with the smaller departments uh, to make sure that there's somebody on duty or in those parts of the counties, um, there needs to be backup. Domestic violence is a 100% uh, two officer responding call. At, at no point in time should somebody show up to a DV call without backup because you don't know what you're going to get. Uh, likewise, and, and it's you're in law enforcement, a traffic stop, a basic traffic stop. There is no routine traffic stop. But if your closest backup is 35 minutes away, 45 minutes away, you might be less proactive. Why are you going to be less proactive? Because the person that is just coming in from Licking County or Fairfield County, you don't know if they have a gun. You don't know if it's who's uh, the registered owner of that car. So it, you have to take your own personal life into, um, you know, in, into that scenario and say, am I going to die today? I've been there. And that's where working as a community is going to be crucial. The smaller departments are crucial to the county. It's, it's not just the sheriff's department, it's every small department, it's every community member working together to make sure we always have backup. If you need a question, re ask Al. Hang on, right back there. Where's that? I'm right in front of you. The big people got here. Well, I went to the patrol of three major police departments in the state, one being, I consider Perry County Sheriff's Office a major law enforcement agency. And I worked just for over a year here, and I started out in patrol and I drove all over. So I understand how to implement a strategic patrol plan to alleviate the problems you're talking about. We need to split up our county zones. We need to collaborate, like Ryan said, with the villages to have the most manpower out on the street at any given time. And of course, the early morning hours are the most scarce for law enforcement out there. But it has to be the knowledge and the experience of being able to use your manpower and the, and the, and the, the assets of what you people can do the best and put them in the areas that they can work. Use the data that you gather over a period of time. Where is the crime patterns at? And then put the manpower there. Officer safety is a huge thing. The training that I received, especially at the department as big as Columbus, we trained constantly. And officer safety was always an issue. And when I was the road supervisor in at the Perry County Sheriff's Office every Saturday morning, the guy that worked for me, we would do, we would have training when we had time. We'd do felony stops, Terry Pats, probably proper Terry Pats, how we, how we do things properly. So that's a great question. And thank you for your service and your family service. sitting here right and that commissioner sitting right back there with right here that chief over here myself included and some of my guys sitting right here all know that pain of being out there by yourself i spent three years out there by myself on night shift while i was a deputy here and i was grateful and i'm still grateful to have the support of the village police departments out here to help us out but as sheriff I don't have to, nor should I, enter into any agreement with any of the villages. And the reason why is my prosecutor told me that that was not a necessity. The director of the Buckeye State Sheriff's Association said that was not the avenue to go down because one reason, I have a mutual aid agreement with 87 other county sheriffs. And all we have to do is call for their help. Now in 2003, Thank goodness to the commissioner where he's at back there. How many of you are here? Ben, you're here, who else is here? Dan, you're over there, and Owen, oh, he's not here. But we have the biggest budget in the sheriff's office we've ever had. All right, and we 
we have as many as two and three officers on each shift. Is that not correct, Gary? My chief deputy right here. So we know the importance of having extra people out there and not being out there by yourself. We don't want that to happen. I don't want that liability and that risk. Chuck, you were one of us too. You were out there by yourself for many years, weren't you? And how did you survive? Learn to use your head, Mary. You learn to use your head and talk, use your mouth, didn't you? Well, those are two great tools, but we still use those. But no, safety is a very important issue for us, one of our biggest issues. We got another candidate here running for commissioner. Aren't you concerned about that then? Absolutely. The safety of the people I have chased. You're the same way, right? I've talked to both of you about it. And what has happened in 2024 is the commissioner has allowed us to change our contract and open the door for lateral transfers and gave these fellows four or five dollars on the hour raise. Is that about right, man? Yeah. So the raise the money came up there. So we became competitive with our surrounding agencies so we wouldn't lose people every time we turn around. Very good question. And yes, like Bob said, thanks for your service. You too, Stephanie. Anybody else got a first question? Uh, this first question is for the two new candidates. Um, Sheriff, I'll get you later on. Um, I live up in the northern part of the county. And the question is, is with the growth of the northern part, northern part of the county, they're right off of Honey Creek. As soon as one of the farmers up there sells a piece of that property, you're going to have four or 500 homes. Mr. Mr. Um, Ruff already mentioned on it about uh, a satellite station. What's your intentions as far as getting more coverage up on the northern part of the county? Um, everybody, not for sure, but the northern part of the county, more taxes are paid in the northern part of the county than the middle part of the county and the southern part of the county. Um, we need some help up there, especially during the summer months with the lake and all of them. All of that. Thank you. Well, first, first off, as far as zoning up in Northern part of the county, I talked to your trustees probably about how I don't know about four or five hundred homes being put up there to establish zoning conditions for where they won't build that quick. But there is going to be growth. When I first came in, I, I live up in Thornville, so uh, coverage up there is very important to me and my family. When I first jumped into law enforcement here in Perry County, I made good friends with people. Uh, at a place called Horvath, there's a coffee shop there and I would hang out there as I rehabilitated my home on the north side of the lake. And we talked about what could be done up there. And we talked, one of the things was a substation. At one time, they were gonna develop that area that's for sale now, right there at the lake. They were gonna put uh, a pavilion there and a bunch of different uh, much like an Easton is what the desire was for that word. It's like you could walk out of your condo and do some shopping. So they wanted to put a substation there. So to answer your question, my, I'm talking to people down these streets in Southern Perry County about putting a substation down there. So to directly answer your question about how we would better serve the northern part of the county is the same thing, the strategic aspect of putting road deputies out there gathering the data and then implementing, putting them out there to do the best job they can in the area. So would I give more attention to Northern Perry County? No, I would, Southern Perry County deserves it too, okay? But, I, but I'll do my due diligence up there, absolutely. Great question, thank you. Like I had mentioned before, uh, I think having a satellite office up there is very important. Um, but with that, and we talked about resources earlier, uh, Thornville, uh, the village of Thornville, and the growth up around Thornville, uh, those resources can also be uh, shared with Thornville PD. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the Sheriff's Department has the ability, and if they're in a mutual aid agreement, 
they are able to utilize officers that are on duty in these smaller departments uh, to send them out where necessary uh, in the county and to help with that. Now, uh, the area where you're talking about, it's determined and everybody's determined for all of that to blow up. I mean, like I said earlier, with Google over in Lancaster and Intel up in Licking County, uh, the, the northern part of the county is going to explode. And we're already seeing that with uh, tax increases and property values doubling and tripling. Uh, that doesn't mean that the northern part of the county needs more attention because they pay more taxes. However, the explosion of uh, you know residential areas uh, up there, I, I think that a substation, uh, a satellite office up there, needs to be uh, highly looked at and needs to be something that is um, manned on a regular basis once we get to that point. But with all of that comes more money and it goes back to the whole, uh, you utilize the uh, resources you have. And that would mean more money towards the sheriff's department. That would mean an increased budget, hopefully, if the commissioners would uh, be willing to help with that, which would get more officers. Um, more pay, uh, more officers that are wanting to get out there and work, and we could um, you know, spread the wealth with the uh, deputies throughout the different shifts and make sure that we have that extra coverage up there when that time comes. Okay. Several years ago, we entered into an agreement with the um, Thorn Township Trustees, the Hopewell Township Trustees, and the uh, Madison Township Trustees, and we had a substation up there. It worked out the trustees' office up there, and it worked out for probably a year and a half, maybe not quite two years. And of course, like everything else, the money runs out. So we had to pull that deputy out of that position up there. Um, it's expensive to put a deputy on the road in this county. You're talking anywhere from 67,000, 65,000 to 87,000, depending upon obviously the most expensive part of the hiring someone is the medical insurance. It's outrageous these days. So a substation up there, I think it's a great idea. I'm all in favor of that. But like Brian said right here, it's, it's an expensive adventure and I just talked to a lady the other day up there on 188 who brought that question up about response time. She said, we never see anybody up here. Well, my first response was, can I try to be funny? Is there a problem here at your house I don't know about? Well, she said, well, no. Is there a problem down this road you live on? She said, well, no. And I said, well, maybe we patrol the areas where problems are occurring and you're just not seeing that. It kind of pacified her, but I suggested to her talking with those trustees and seeing if they would reconsider setting down with me and negotiating a contract to put a deputy a substation up there, not just one this time, but two or three. And like Brian pointed out, these commissioners back here are the ones that we're going to hold accountable for the funding of that office. So they've been so good to me now, I can't complain. I've got more deputies now than I've ever had. I've got a supervisor on each shift. I've got new cars coming. I've got more tasers coming. I've got Shotguns changed over to non-lethal weapons now and everything. We've got body cameras, we're getting upgraded. So they've helped us out a lot. We need to thank these guys when they're here tonight for what they have done for your sheriff's office. So I'm all in favor of a substation up there. I'd like to work right here out of hand. That's two minutes. Do you have another question? I was going to get back to it. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. Anybody else have a first question? So we're talking about substations throughout the county and the possibility of that and money is always an issue. I'm very well aware of the commissioner being kind of the sheriff's department at this point in time. I live in Southern Perry County. I'm very well aware of the influx that Intel is having and Google is having on the northern part of the county and it's all a trickle down effect. However, with that happening, there's also a push from the city and in Southern Perry County, we have a lot of influx of other people, out of towners as people we call them. With that comes drugs, crime, um, and we have more people moving into the area and people buying land and they're using it as weekend rental property or weekend properties to
come from the city. How are you going to address those issues that we're going to start facing and already have been facing in our neck of the woods, so to speak? Gentlemen? Uh, so, like we discussed with the north end of the, the county, well, a substation a satellite office down in the southern part of the county I think is a great idea and it goes back to resources and utilizing what we have available. Uh, you know, working with the smaller departments, those uh, smaller departments, Corning, New Straitsville, Shawnee, may have one full-time officer. Uh, they might work four days a week, five days a week, uh, but I'm going to go back to my indictments. Uh, what I was talking about earlier is uh, the increase in drugs and the increase in property crimes. If we're prosecuting, if we're doing what we should be doing and we're presenting cases to the prosecutor's office, these people aren't just running around. Uh, we're catching them or we're indicting them or getting them locked up and people are going to start to see, criminals are going to see, we don't wanna mess around here in Perry County because if we mess around here in Perry County, we're going to prison. And that's a, that's a mindset that we need to have across the county, not just in the North End or just the South End, but the entire county. And it, it, again, it goes back to resources and doing what we need to do to make sure that we are locking people up. Um, and, and I know, and I do want to respond to your statement. I know it wasn't a question, but at some point I would like to respond to your statement. Uh, it's not just about locking people up, but it's taking care of the problem. Like I said, answered the gentleman's question over there, I talked to the uh, law enforcement down in the streets so about putting the uh, substation down there and the cost is zero i mean we use their police department there when i talked to the guys up in uh, thorn township it was the cost was zero okay inviting people does not put them away we gotta convict them we need to implement I, I keep saying this, this the strategic plan with an aggressive drug enforcement task force. When I first came to Perry County, I was down driving around the Corning area and I was doing some paperwork and, and the Eagle Spark and on. A gentleman drove up next to me and thought it was TJ Ross. I don't know why. He does much better looking than I am. But nevertheless, he put up next to me and said, hey, uh, he was from Westerville. And he bought his dream property down in the corner. It's beautiful down here. It's unbelievable. It's like a postcard. I like that great. It's beautiful down here. And he, he liked it so much that he brought his uh, pastor's pastor bought property right next to him. And they were going to build their dream house. And they put a uh, camper there. And they were bringing in supplies and things of that nature to start the project. But every time they would go home, the West Road to come back and the stuff was gone. Okay. Time and time again, all of his his pastor and all his neighbors, the same thing happened. So we're not gonna build our dream home here. Now he bought property down in Florida. All right, he's, he's got his hundred acres there, he's gonna hunt it, but he's not gonna build there. That's a shame. Right? And it's a spillover effect from the drug trade, ladies and gentlemen. That's what that's why they are uh, pillaging your property and taking everything because they need to support the drug out of it. So we can do that with task force and collaboration with agencies from around the area. Thank you. Missy, thanks for your question, Richard. I understand uh, your concern right there with the North versus the South. I don't think there's a war going on here in this county, at least I hope there's not. You know, one thing old Sheriff Tom Wilson told me, he said, I told him one day I was going to run for sheriff. And he was a big, 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 huge guy, pretty big. He, was, uh, he walked up to me, put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, Barker, I want you just to remember one thing. They treat everybody the same. 
always treat everybody the same. So I'm not going to show any more favoritism to one end of the county than I am the other end. I took an oath to serve all of you people. Those in the southern end, those in the northern end, those in the central, whatever part of Perry County. And I don't think any of you can say I've been reluctant to respond to, call you, come to your house, or take some action to address your concern. And even yours, I might have been 10 or 11 years, but if you don't call and you don't bring it forward and you don't ask me, how do you expect me to fix it? It's kind of tough. But what I'd like to add to these comments, these fellows, we just want to take everybody working together to take care of a crime problem. The police can't arrest our way out of the drug problem. We've done that for years. We're never going to arrest our way out of that. It takes cooperation from witnesses, cooperation from victims, compiling information, enough for a prosecutor to put a case together that has enough probable cause to try this person in court. Now, of those indictments that I told you about, we didn't lose any of those cases in court. So, they were convictions, Bob, just so you know. Thank you. Good questions. First one question. Anybody? Dollar money is tight everywhere. I know it's 
seems to be a less tax base down south than it does up north. I tried at one time to pass a 911 weapon and it failed. I tried a second and a third time and it failed. It wasn't until this last time that a levy was passed to support the 911 dispatch center and stuff. But you know the lesson I learned out of that whole time and every time we got turned down is that it's the taxpayers that we're asking to fund these offices. It's the taxpayers that got an increase in their taxes this year, isn't it? What do you think of the chances of a tax levy passing now to support law enforcement, fire EMS? It could be very difficult. Commissioner's back here. What do you think of that idea? Huh? Ben's already shaking his head. Uh, Thad? Huh? You want to pay more taxes? How about you, Chase? No. It's tough, man. Nobody wants to pay any more taxes. So either the money comes from what we currently have, right? And the only options that anyone has is to restructure some offices, cut people's jobs out, lay people off to put more money in the now, who wants to see that? I don't. I can't support that. And I can't support a tax levy when I know it's going to be the taxpayers that pay for it. I agree with that. That's why I asked. Yeah. yeah, there are some grants out there that help out with some issues in law enforcement like that. I had grants before. I had the Cops Fast Grant, Cops More Grant. I had two or three of them under the Clinton administration. We hired deputies. I had more deputies back in. How many did we have? We was up to 30 some deputies back in. But when that money ran out, the agreement was that we retained them for one year. And at the end of that one year, if there's no money there, guess what happened to them? Tell them, Ted. Two minutes. They got laid off. I had to cut back. I ended up cutting off some of these people over here. We went 12, 13, 14 people deep just to survive that year. And we slowly built back. Thanks to the guys we have now. First question, anybody? No, respond to Yeah, no, we got it. It doesn't cost any money to use the facilities we already have. Like I said before, these Dreesville has, would love to have us down there. Up north, they would love to have us in the facilities that they have. That, 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 it doesn't cost any money for that. We already have deputies on the road. Just put them down there. Strategically put them down there. I use that word again. Okay. When I went to the sheriff's office, we had 25 deputies working there. Okay, we had a supervisor, first shift, and two, and two deputies working for a short amount of time, and then you know, things went sideways for various reasons. So, 2.8 million operating uh, dollar operating budget is a lot of money that we can disseminate over, you know, the, the entire office. So, I don't understand why we need money to put anybody anywhere. We already have. Them. We just need to use them better. And we need to have the knowledge to be able to do that. It's not about money or, or putting a burden on the taxpayers. The burden's on us. We're the ones being paid to do the job. Okay? And together we can do it. It's our responsibility. And we can do it. Thanks for the question. You had made the comment, uh, maybe up north we could do it, but not down south, we couldn't do that. Uh, as a sheriff, you're responsible for the entire county. So if the money is there for the north end, the money is there for the south end. Uh, it also goes back to uh, utilizing your resources. And I know I keep going back to that, but uh, as the sheriff said, there are grants out there. And if you write for the grants, you can get money. Uh, the state was given all kinds of money during COVID for, uh, especially during all of the anti-law enforcement protests, the state was given millions of dollars for retention and training for departments. Uh, that's money that could have been utilized or could have been obtained. And there are other grants out there that you can get. Um, but I will also go back to the idea of a jail. Uh, a jail is, uh, it's a business, it, it's a money maker and can be a money maker. And those are funds that can go back towards the county and back into hiring more officers or giving better pay increases to where it's more desirable for officers to come to the Perry County Sheriff's Office so that we can have those officers and be fully staffed or be staffed better than what we've been in years. 
and then we can put somebody up north and down south because we're all working together to do the same job and that's protect our community. First question, anybody? As a non-resident of Fair County, say I'm passing through and I'm speeding. And for instance, an officer, excuse me, an officer is part of my French but being an ass. And I get treated unfairly. What can you do if I report him to you in a, in a case or something such as that? Anywhere you can go first. So, uh, as the sheriff, if elected, that's obviously that would fall on uh, disciplinary action. That's something that needs to be looked at and reviewed. Uh, we, I'm sure we've all had encounters uh, with officers that are just having a bad day and they decide they, they want to treat you with whatever they've got going on in their mind and in their personal life. And that happens. Uh, it's not acceptable because we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard, but we still have to answer to somebody. And that's the job of the sheriff to make sure that that's not a recurring problem. Uh, a recurring problem of the same officer is a hindrance to the department and is a liability in the long run because eventually that is going to escalate. And then it's not just a Oh, you're getting a speeding ticket today and tomorrow and the next day because I'm coming across you every day. It could come into uh, illegal search and seizures. It could come into high speed uh, interactions where officers are just running lights and sirens for no reason. And that's not a liability that anybody wants to have. So it would be looked into, it would be investigated, and um, you know, if disciplinary action is required, then that's what's gonna happen. We, gotta, we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard and we have to hold the department accountable. Brian's right on, that's exactly how we would handle that issue that we've had before. We've had that bad apple out there that's giving somebody a hard time. But the good thing about where we're at right now with our deputies is having those body cameras available where we can download the footage of maybe that traffic stop where he treated you very rudely. Those things are worth their weight in gold. But the flip side of that is when we get a guy like you that comes in and complains about it, says this guy was above him, and we play back the video, and it doesn't show any wrongdoing, it works to our benefit as well protection of the office. So in, in that particular case right there, if we can qualify your complaint and validate what you say took place by looking at the body camera, interviewing that deputy, going through the uh, process of doing an investigative interview, and he admits to that, then we can take disciplinary action against that We've done before. Thank you. Good question. So your question is, what, how would we handle a uh, citizen complaint? Uh, in my experience, uh, it was a grievance representative for the Paternal Order of Police for a couple of decades, and I served on what we call the Employee Action Review Committee, where Paternal Affairs reported to us, and we evaluated problem officers and suggested remedial action and training for them to be able to become better officers and get over their whatever issues they might have. Law enforcement officers operate on the, in light of what is reasonable, what a reasonable person would do, and what society would think is reasonable, what the courts would think is reasonable in light of the totality of the circumstances involving your incident. So we would take all that into consideration, okay? Against the backdrop, of course, of 
case law and statutory law. And then, so your complaint will be taken with great weight, and but the, the officer would also have due process, okay, because they, they have the right to the will too, and they're human beings, so you know, they're gonna make mistakes, they might be having a bad day. So all those things are taken into consideration, and then uh, it's evaluated, and then the officer will be disciplined if necessary. So thank you for the question. All right, I've gotten several text messages. There's a few people need, need to greet, need to use the restroom. The ladies' room is back there to the left. The men's room is over to the right. The hallway is the individual restroom. However you identify. <laughs> All right, I'll go first. Yeah, just do a five minutes and come back. Can we do a beat on? I have no idea. My fingers are frozen. I forgot to bring a crack down. There was a I didn't cover Thank you, sir. all my bases. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. 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 So, are they kicking us out at 8.30? Oh, that no, I have to close to 8.00 9.00. Okay. So, I'm going to go to 8.00 Okay. How's that working out for you? Good. 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 Thank 
be able to hear those things in order to fix it. You know, as I've been told, I'm not there 24 seven. I thought I was, Jackie, but she brought that point up and I wasn't. But I have to hear about those type of calls right there in order to fix that problem. So if it happens, please let me know. Thank you. Good question, Ellen. Shane, you want to? Well, the way we operate with Somerset is uh, we have the public access line that we call it, but because we're not managing a 24 hour police service at this point, we'll have a cell phone that I carry so you can call the cell phone. Now, that takes, that takes commitment. Just uh, like yesterday, I on my day off. The coroner's office called because we had a, we had a fatal in the building, so I responded to that. So that takes commitment from the staff that you have to be able to pass that around. I'm not saying that other villages don't have that commitment. I believe me, I work with Ryan, I work with you know Chief Williams up in Porterville, and all the chiefs around, and they're all very committed to what they have to do. But the resources are limited, which makes it, in my opinion, the responsibility of the chief law enforcement officer of the county to make sure that these areas are covered. Because we all know the limited resources that these villages have. So with the big budget and being the big boys in the block, it is a responsibility of the preeminent law enforcement agency in the county to be able to cover your calls for service. <clears throat> service, okay? No excuses. It can be done. Great question. I, I, I think we uh, talked about this a little bit ago. Uh, well, I know we did. Uh, I don't think that anybody in the southern part of the county is any less important than the people in the northern part of the county. If you have a call and it's important and we have officers available to get there, we're gonna get there. And if we have the resources and the ability to get there, we're going to get there. Uh, and I, again, it goes back to managing your resources and making sure you have officers on duty uh, to respond to those calls. Now, I don't work and have never worked for the Perry County Sheriff's Office. Uh, so I, I can't do specifics for you, but, uh, you know, there, there are times with the job that I have that there are officers that are just unavailable. Uh, there are other things that are going on. And, uh, you know, some calls require two or three officers. Some require four or five. Some only require one. Uh, but it doesn't make you any less important. Uh, if your call is in and you're on the board to be uh, have your situation Handled, we're going to handle it. Thank you. Does anybody else have a first question? Okay. We are very limited on time. This may be the last question. My apologies. I only have the ability for a certain amount of time. Yes, my question is for Mr. Barker. I, it's my understanding that the code task force had been disbanded and that the three officers that work there are no longer there. My question to you is, have it, has that task force been reinstated? And if not, why? It has been. I was out for a one year period. I shut that down in 2021, in January of 2021, just simply to be able to reorganize and restructure that particular function. I had three guys in there who were working strictly drugs and one guy doing property crimes. I came up with a plan to consolidate those officers together. I had a move, I had Briggs in there, I had Conrad in there, I had Starrett in there for a while, and I had someone else that I can't the name slips in right now, but a year later, I rejoined him. I went back in there. I found the reasons because I needed to uh, have drug lab testing done. And it was so expensive uh, to have that done 
at an outside lab and paid code for that, it was better off for me to pay the, the annual fee of $2,500. So since then, I've reassigned at least four, if not five people back into that code organization. In fact, we've got a board meeting this week. I think it's Friday, is that right, Bob? It's this Friday and up in Newark right here. So we'll be at that meeting right there, uh, contributing whatever information we have to contribute. But during that time, I stepped out of that task force. I just want you to know that two of the sheriffs around me reached out to me and said, look, Sheriff, if you need anything, all you got to do is call us. Licking County Sheriff Fort and Skeeny County Sheriff Boots both reached out to me. And they were two of the people that I've been in that uh, task force with for quite some time. And their question was, was there a problem with the task force? I said, absolutely not. I just need to take care of some issues here locally. I did that rejoin, go back up to speed in that, going to that task force. That answered your question? What's the rest of it? No, I, I was just under the impression that, uh, that that wasn't reinstated. I mean, there's been no, nothing put out that it's been reinstated. Well, it's been, it's been quite a while. If you look at some of our, yeah, our I'll try and answer the question. If you look at some of our news releases and look on our Facebook, you'll see that the code task force mentioned in there uh, that we used them to participate with them. We went to doing most of our news releases on Facebook because the Times Recorder Office is around here in Somerset. The Tribune News doesn't come around like they used to and ask us for any updated news. So we've taken it upon ourselves to release information, put it on our Facebook on all things that happen up there, including the code task force. Now, we made the biggest seizure of our whole office just last year up in Fort Ford up there, the biggest one of all. And uh, we had more cases in the grand jury this last time than we had the year before in drug cases. So I think we're on the right track. Thank you. Good question. All right, moving forward now, I'm going to give credit to the uh, companies who sponsor this to make it possible. And then we will go into closing statements for the candidates here. AA Auto LLC Personal Use Car Sales, within House Financing, Healthcare Brothers, Well Drilling and Contractor and Corning Service and Repair, Oil and Gas Wells, Dozing and Track Hill Work, Gravel Hauling, Brine Hauling, Oil and Gas Division and Consulting, Clayton Homes, Affordable Modular Homes, Single Wide and Double Wide Displays are available to tour. Use Clayton Homes for your next home buying experience. <coughs> Google's Funeral Home, Family Care Needs, Send Flowers, Brief Support, Get Help Planning Ahead, Memorial Service, Memorial Services, and much more. Frank's Towing and Used Car Parts. Contact Frank next time you need a tow or used car parts. New in Healthcare and Rehab, Senior Living and Assistance, committed to providing loving care and quality service to our residents and their families. Main Street Laundromat in Kirksville and is available for self-serve laundry needs as it is near several restaurants and shopping facilities. KJ's Market, grocery store on China Street near the Village Park for your gasoline, tobacco, alcohol, and grocery needs. Shepler's Straight Shooters in Kirksville, gunsmithing and customization and repair. We do curl shooting, order parts, and do the repairs. Shepler's offers full cleaning services on all firearms. Shepler's is also interested in buying used guns. We can order new firearms as well. For closing statements, each candidate will be given, I believe, was it two minutes or was it three? That was three rocket. Three? Is it? I should have that memorized. Three. Three? Okay. We we'll do three minutes per candidate. I believe Parker was first, but it's pretty cool. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for asking. I'll get these mixed up quite a bit. Ralph, you are first. Three minutes. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, anybody that's at home watching this, uh, I am I'm a proud Perry County. I grew up here in Crooksville. I've lived in Somerset. I've lived in Thornville. 
I've seen friends overdose and die or have had them overdose and pass over the years. Um, I've had friends go to prison because of drugs. I've known people to have been arrested and been given the option to go to a six month rehab. And, and I believe that goes to your statement earlier. And they're still clean today. And that's six years later. Not everything has to end with going to prison. Uh, however, it does put people in positions with uh, indictments and with proper prosecution uh, to get clean. Um, I want to make some change with Perry County, uh, not just for today, not just because of what's happened in the past, but what's coming, uh, the future of Perry County. And I have 15 to 20 years of law enforcement left before I can before I'm even allowed to retire. Um, I don't have another pension coming in. Uh, I don't have a choice but to, if, get, if I'm elected, to do a good job because in four years, I'm going to want the job again. Not only am I going to want the job again, but I'm gonna need the job again because I can't retire and I don't have a backup income to rely on. So if elected as the Perry County Sheriff, I'm going to do the best that I can and utilize the resources that I have to do what I need to do for the communities around here. Thank you. The Perry County Sheriff's Office should be an agency where a young deputy starts his or her career and finishes it successfully with honor and great satisfaction 30 years later. Only one deputy has retired from the Perry County Sheriff's Office in the last 27 plus years. That's concerning. Ladies and gentlemen, when you support a candidate, your vote carries with it great weight. I know you do not take this lightly. Who helms the Sheriff's Office in Perry County is of grave importance. It will directly affect the lives of tens of thousands of people, whether they even are aware of it or not. I'd like to thank Sheriff Barker for his service over the last few decades. But there comes a time when we recognize, or we must recognize the need for change. And when that time comes, we then need to recognize who next is capable of carrying out that change by virtue of his experience, accomplishments, and clear vision as to what lies ahead. Detective Ruff, thank you for your service in Zanesville and your candidacy. I ask you to own that perhaps your inexperience shows that now is not your time. For example, the syllabus for the Opato Basic Hostage Negotiators course that you took, and you said you were a hostage negotiator, was written by my team. You studied what I did every day, material based on the hundreds of incidents that I responded to. And that's a very positive thing for you. And I have to go off script here for a second and say that I bring the training that I've had with great organizations over a period of a lot of years. And I talked about a go bag before, just the things that was, we were taking for granted from being trained. Now, we have two, we have law enforcement officers here, we have three of us sitting up here, and if somebody walked through that door, who would be more capable of handling the situation? I never went anywhere without carrying a weapon. That's the way I was trained. I have 57 rounds on me right now. If, if something went down, I could handcuff that person, I could radio for help. Can my counterparts do that now? Ladies and gentlemen, I am a lover of our Constitution and the Second Amendment. I have been endorsed by the Buckeye Firearms Association. And it's been a lot of fun going around knocking on doors and talking to people in Perry County. It's been a great experience. I want to thank everybody for that. I ask you to visit my website, showinsforsheriff.com, to learn more about me. Email me at showinsforsheriff at gmail.com and ask me any questions. And I humbly request 
the honor of your vote come election day. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, for showing up here this evening. Appreciate uh, what I've learned from you, especially about myself. Hmm. I'd like to clarify a question I made a comment about our county prosecutor being part-time. Um, I was referring to how he's paid. He's paid part-time as a prosecutor, paid part-time through the business and stuff. But I got to say, and I meant this well, that he's always there for us, no matter what time of day it is, morning, night, Saturday or Sunday. All we have to do is call Joe, and he's there. Is that better, Dan? Yes, I think so. I didn't mean that in the sense that he only did part-time stuff for us, but he limits the case numbers that we take to our to the grand jury. So anyway, on the closing statements here, I just like to say that uh, you know I'm not going to brag about myself. Um, you know I've got 32 years of being sheriff. I've got you know 11 years of being a police chief and served in the military for 38 and a half years. I ended up retiring as a first sergeant, and in addition to many courses of leadership, maintenance, management and recruitment, I do possess the necessary skills and training to be sheriff. I've met all the state requirements that are asked of each sheriff every year to meet certain mandated hours, and I've attended all of them. In fact, I just finished those Thursday. But it all comes down to one thing, March the 19th, 2024, who will the people? I say that again, I put parentheses around that. Who will the people choose to lead the office of Perry County Sheriff? There's three of us here asking for your support. Will you choose someone who is your friend, or someone because of their age? Will you check the record and seek the facts? Or will you base your decision on experience in a leadership role? That's not been discussed here, how many leadership roles the three of us have been in. I think my record pretty well speaks for itself. What I have done as a leader in your community, what I've done as a leader uh, in my military service. So again, I'd just like to thank everybody for turning out here this evening. I appreciate all your questions. I'll stay around and ask if you have more you'd like to ask. But again, thank you, and please make the right choice for the right reasons. Thank you. If everybody would, these three gentlemen up here all volunteered to be here. I did not have to twist their arm or drag them here. They probably had no idea what they were in for when they showed up or before they even were invited. So if you would, give them a round of applause for showing up. <laughs> if anybody needs any assistance getting out here, reach out to me, and I will do my best to send help your way. Have a good night, and thank you for coming. <laughs>